Hello. Uh, today I'd like to talk to you about manned space flight and the benefits thereof, or perhaps uh, the lack of benefits thereof. And there are two reasons that I've chosen to talk about this uh, this week. The first of those is that it was almost exactly 60 years ago to the day that John F. Kennedy gave his famous address to the US Congress, announcing that it was his intention to put an American on the moon by the end of the decade, that is, by the end of the 1960s. And the rest, of course, is history. We know that on the 20th of July, 1969, Neil Armstrong and two other ast astronauts whose names have unfortunately been forgotten by many, like me, landed on the moon. And that event gave rise to possibly one of the most famous expressions in the English language, of course. A small step for man, a giant leap for mankind, as spoken by Neil Armstrong when he first set foot on the moon. Um, that whole space program over 10 or 15 years was called the Apollo program. It wasn't all successes, of course. There, there were a couple of uh, serious disasters with loss of life, but um, that's a topic for another day. The other reason that I wanted to talk about manned spaceflight today was because it is, again, very much in the news, not specifically this week, but it has been over the last couple of years. Um, the European Space Agency, together with NASA, have um, announced that they're going to try not just to put people back on the moon, but actually to build a moon station where people would be able to live and work. The cost of that project for NASA uh, is estimated at something like 35 billion US dollars, so it, it's a huge project. Uh, China, too, is very interested in um, putting a Taikonaut, a Chinese astronaut, on the moon, and they recently landed uh, a vehicle on the moon and brought back samples of moon rock. And although China hasn't officially said they want to put an, a Taikonaut on the moon, the vehicle that they used uh, for this moon landing last year was clearly one that was later going to be developed to take uh, people aboard rather than just be an automatic robotic mission. And then, of course, there's Elon Musk. Elon Musk doesn't just want to go to the moon. He wants to go all the way to Mars. Um, so what are the benefits of taking uh, human astronauts to Mars? Well, I want to just read to you quickly from the report that I handed out earlier, uh, which is a, a, a document drafted by NASA. And uh, if you would just turn to page three of that document, you can see a section that begins uh, rechargeable hearing aids. And I'd like to begin by reading there. Even decades after the moon landing, new spin-off technologies from the Apollo program continue to arrive on the market. The world's first practical rechargeable hearing aid batteries, which debuted in 2013, built on extensive work that NASA did during and after the Apollo missions. The command module that went to the moon used silver zinc batteries, the lightest known battery materials. But the agency also wanted to make the cells, the battery cells, rechargeable. And innovators at NASA spent many years experimenting with a variety of different materials and systems. They vastly improved the technology, although, in actual fact, their technology never made it into space. Uh, a company founded in 1996 picked up where NASA left off, but it took many more years of work to make a viable product. Hearing aid batteries have always been disposable because the zinc batteries that can be made small enough to fit in them aren't rechargeable. Now this company's silver zinc hearing aid batteries can hold enough power to last all day 
and can be recharged a thousand times without losing performance. And there's more to come. These are just a few of the co numerous commercial products from humanity's first trips to the moon. The full stories for these and other Apollo technologies that have made their way into everyday life can be found at the NASA spin-off website. As NASA plans its upcoming Artemis moon missions to the moon with new objectives and long-term exploration goals, it's clear that once again, much of the necessary technology and infrastructure doesn't yet exist for sustainable missions. For example, the agency plans to extract resources from the lunar surface. Engineers will need to figure out how to turn frozen water locked in the moon's surface into drinkable water, breathable oxygen and usable rocket fuel. None of this will be easy, but that's why the effort will prove so fruitful. End of quote. Now, I think it's particularly interesting that this is what NASA sees as the benefits. And NASA, of course, is always going to give a very positive line on this. But if you read between the lines of the whole report that I gave you and the part that I just read out, what do you actually have as a benefit of a 15-year moon space program? I would say not very much. I mean, hearing aids that only started to be developed in 1996, 25 years after the moon landing. Um, the text also mentions space blankets and food safety. What I think is interesting is that none of these technologies that are cited in the NASA report actually result from having gone to the moon. I mean, they're the result of trying to undertake a long space journey, but that could have just been a round trip without landing on the moon. None of this technology really specifically relates to actually putting people on the moon. And I think that's important because the cost of these projects is absolutely astronomical. Uh, the NASA project in the 1960s cost 20 billion US dollars, which if you adjust for inflation or you, you put that into today's prices, is the equivalent of 260 billion US dollars. Um, that's, that's almost half what the US spends running all of its schools for a year. So it's, it's a colossal amount of money. It was a colossal amount of money. And I'm not convinced myself that uh, the, the benefits really justify that amount of money. Now, you might have thought today that I was going to argue that uh, space exploration wasn't terribly environmentally sound. And, and you could. You, you look at a, a, a rocket and you see all that smoke coming out of the back. You think it's, it's got to be bad for climate change or whatever. But actually, the, the, the exhaust from a, a rocket is mostly water. Um, and compared to commercial airliners, the, the, the number of rocket flights is so few that they're not actually making a significant impact on the environment. But I don't think they're making a particular impact on anything else either. And this is the problem. Um, the science benefit just isn't there. There is a cultural benefit, but I wonder if that really justifies it. I mean, the Apollo missions, for example, have given rise to no fewer than 25 Hollywood films. One of the best, I think, was with uh, with Tom Hanks. Um, and, of course, another fabulously famous English expression was given us by the Apollo missions. Houston, we have a problem. Um but does that really justify the money and the effort that's gone into these programs? And I would say not. Even the, uh, the International Space Station, which is also manned spaceflight, doesn't really offer quite as much as one would think. A lot of the science relates to uh, science in a no-gravity environment, for example. Well, on Earth we have gravity, so science in no-gravity is not that useful to us on Earth. All of the best science from space has come from unmanned space flights. Think for about GPS, for example. 
the global navigation satellite network that makes Google Maps possible. Google Maps is such an integral part of our everyday life. We're using it all day long every day. And that's based on unmanned spaceflight. Environmental photography, so Earth observation. We know that, for example, the Amazon forest is being cut down too quickly because satellites are up there taking photographs. But these are unmanned satellites. The science that comes out of the photography of Earth from satellites is absolutely extraordinary and far outweighs anything that the, the moon missions ever offered us. Similarly, space telescopes have helped us understand physics, the mysteries of physics and how the universe began. But they're unmanned. So to, to sum up, my argument is, I think, that manned spaceflight really doesn't offer us any more than unmanned spaceflight. But it's much more expensive. Um, it's really, I think, it's all about politics. It's about playground competition. The Americans want to be first on the moon. The Russians want to be first on the moon. Elon Musk wants to be first on Mars. Who has the biggest rocket? It's, it's a little bit like in our modern day, taking selfies everywhere. You take a selfie at the top of Mount Everest. Now people want a selfie on the moon, but it doesn't really serve a purpose. So I would call on everybody, politicians, people, just to, to wake up a little bit and continue with space exploration. Yes, it can be useful, but let's put a stop to manned space flights. They're really not worth the time or the effort. Thank you.